Good morning, Evergreen. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Don. I, I probably know about half of you here. Uh, it's good to be up here because I can take my mask off and my glasses don't fog up, which, which is a good thing. So, um, so I, I, I'm one of, um, I'm sorry, Don Elliott, my wife Donna is over there as well. Uh, we're from downtown Grace, Saskatoon. Uh, we've been with Grace now for about four years. Um, I've been a believer since 1983, so getting a little long in the tooth. Uh, but, I, but I really have to say, these last number of years, I've felt more alive than I've ever felt as a believer. All right? the, the gospel of Jesus has just been more alive to me these last few years. Um, I have the um, privilege of being an elder apprentice at, at, at Saskatoon, downtown, and uh, really learning how to really just live in that role again, just living as a, as a servant of Christ and, and just loving it. So... Today, we'll be wrapping up that great chapter in love, of love in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. You hear it at just about every wedding, every other wedding. You know, it's touted as, as the love chapter, but it's way more than that, as I'm sure that you know. See, Paul is writing this, this, this letter this, to the church in Corinth. And uh, the church in Corinth thought they knew a whole lot about love. Right? They were the city that prided themselves on their understanding of what love was. They prided themselves so much that they considered themselves to be love experts. They built temples to the goddess Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love. Not just one temple, but temples, plural, all over the place, celebrating love. If you were looking for love, this city, they thought, and in particular the temple, was your one-stop shop. The problem was, as the country song goes, they were looking for love in all the wrong places. Their view of love, much like our culture today, is a distorted one. A view centered on self, centered on my feelings, my self-fulfillment. The here today, gone tomorrow kind of love. A passing fancy to be enjoyed while it lasts. And Paul says, you've got it all wrong. That's not love at all. You see, love puts others ahead of yourself. It's other-focused, not self-focused. I just wanted to recap some, uh, some verses from last week, and we'll hear them again on the video, but uh, that kind of just packages and sets the table for us what love is. So love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We can spend a lot of time just looking at love and what that is, but as important as that is, it's important that we remember it's part of a broader context that Paul is talking about. You see, we can't just simply break this chapter apart from the rest of Corinthians and deal with it as, uh, all on its own. It's part of a discussion that Paul is talking about, dealing with spiritual things that he starts in chapter 12, where he's talking about spiritual people and spiritual things and spiritual gifts. You know, the, the, the spirit-filled people of God, filled and gifted in various ways, diverse people with diverse giftings, coming together in one body, Proclaiming Jesus through miracles and preaching and helps and tongues and all of the other ways the Holy Spirit manifests himself in and through us into the world. And Paul is clear at the beginning of this chapter, as good as these gifts are, as good as, and they are good, right? These manifestations of the Holy Spirit working in and through us in power, as good as that is, there is still a more excellent way. Remember how he, he led into chapter 13? Let me show you a still more excellent way. Let me tell you about love. Paul said earlier in this chapter, without love, the greatest of these manifestations is just noise. It's a clanging symbol, a gong. It's only by and through and from the overflow of love that spiritual gifts have any meaning or power in the first place. And only through the kind of love described here, an everlasting love, I like to call it Jesus love. 
Let's now listen to our, the whole passage on uh, the whole scripture passage on love. And you can, it'll be on the screen, but you can follow around along in your Bibles or apps as well. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So we pick up love today in verse 8 with this simple yet profound proclamation, love never ends. And really, this is the 16th verb describing love, the other 15 in the previous four verses. And Paul writes, love never ends. Your translation may say something a little different. It may say love never fails. Uh, it could be paraphrased as love never falls down it's always there, it always has been, and it always will. But it's simpler just to say love never ends. You know, all of us will experience love in a variety of ways and different degrees. We've all felt that love of a parent or a spouse or our children. That one special friend that's always there when we need them. Pick up the phone and we know they're going to talk to us. And not only do we experience love, uh, but we're wired, pre-wired and created in such a way that we wanted to give love. You know, that's part of our DNA. That's part of the image-bearing aspect of how we were created. And so we love our spouses. We love our family. We love our children. But we can also love work, um, some of us. Uh, we can love food. We can love sports. We can even just love relaxing, right? Just, like, just chilling out, and we can love that. Some loves are, are surfacy and fleeting, and others are, uh, run, a little, run very deep and are intimate. And we all have, in our, in our experience, in our lifetime, uh, and, and experienced some type of love that has not lasted, right? Love that we thought would be there forever, but is gone. Love that has failed us. You know, I used to love, my mom tells me, I used to love liver and onions when I was a child, until someone explained to me what a liver was. Um, I've learned to get over that, I've adjusted. But I remember when I was seven, uh, I loved my dog, and my dog died. And that was kind of the first experience I had with death. Last year, my mom passed away, and, and that was hard. That was, it was really hard to take and, and work through that. Love that we thought would be here forever didn't last. I know some of you may have lost loved ones recently, or had love that you thought would last a lifetime torn away from you, the rug pulled out from underneath, a marriage dissolving around or gone entirely. Where is love? Where is everlasting or lasting love? And how do we, how do we reconcile that with the statement that Paul makes when he says, love never fails, because in our experience with love, it often does fail. Right? Is that a dilemma? No, because love... Is not a feeling or emotion blown away by the blown about by the wind, but love is a person, and the kind of love talked about here is Jesus, Jesus' love, 
And so Jesus' love never fails, right? The Jesus' love never ends. And when th things seem so unpredictable and divisive, like in these last 18 months, so confusing, so much like the world uh, is crushing uh, in, uh, around us, that statement, love never fails, that truth, that's comforting, isn't it? It's uplifting and soothing because uh, it's good to know that he never fails us. That's really good news. You see, truth and ultimate love never ends. I think maybe that's the exclamation point in the list of, the, the list of love verbs, isn't it? That's the double exclamation point if you're on Facebook or on, on texting, right? Or the little heart emojis and so on. It's that kind of exclamation. Love never ends, but the verse, doesn't, the verse doesn't end there because it talks about something that will end. And we read on, other things will come to an end. Continuing on in verse 8, it says, As for prophecies, prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Prophecies, tongues, knowledge, these are spiritual gifts. These end. You know, as great as these spiritual gifts, these manifestations of the Spirit, as I like to call them, are, they will pass away. At some time in the future to Paul, these gifts will cease. Why? Well, Paul tells us why. He says the purpose for which the gifts are granted will have been complete, will, will, will have been finished, will have, will have come to an end. And the big question in my mind when I read this is when? When is this going to happen? Has it already happened? Right? When, when is this? And that's a good question. I'm a I like to think I'm a logical kind of a guy, and so I like to work through things logically and put the pieces together. Paul does that for us as well in, Paul, in these illustrations that Paul's going to give us. We'll see the illustrations in the few, uh, shortly, but what Paul is going to be saying here is that, that these things are in the future to Paul, right? Will cease. So as far as Paul was writing here, this hasn't happened yet. It will be coming to, to happen in the future for him. And I think we'll see as we work through this, they're still in the future for us, which is good. Because if they were in the future to us, we would expect to see the things that the, the church in Corinth saw. We'd expect to see the things that the, 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 the book of Acts, the experiences in the book of Acts have, where the Holy Spirit is working in and through his body, the church. We'd expect to see these things, and we do. We see the Spirit gifting as he wills and as he deems best and in, in the people that he chooses on his mission, this mission of love. Paul's going to lay out two key arguments here in verses 8 to 10. Uh, prophecies, yeah, so continuing on, verse 8 said, prophecies will pass away, tongues will cease, knowledge passing away. But in verse 9, Paul writes, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So here Paul is contrasting the now with the future, the partial with the perfect. He contrasts the now where we know in part and prophesy in part uh, and speak in tongues in part with the future when these things have passed away. And the time when that happens, the key here, the, the hinge verse is in verse 10. It's the when statement. Do you see the when statement? It's when the perfect comes. Until that point, the Spirit manifests himself in and through the church, and that goes on. And that, when that point happens, those things cease, and, and then the perfect comes. The partial will pass away. So as I said, when Paul, pen, Paul penned this letter, that, that was in the future tense for him. It had not yet happened. So it couldn't have been those events that happened in the past that he was referring to. Paul couldn't have been referring to when Jesus came as a baby in the manger. He was perfect then. He came to the world. But that couldn't be what Paul was talking about because that would be in the past. And likewise, for the same reason, Paul couldn't have been talking about when the Holy Spirit came to the church, the Holy Spirit who is God and therefore also perfect, that had also been in the past. That happened at Pentecost in Jerusalem um, shortly after Jesus rose or ascended into heaven. So therefore, that timeline that Paul had in his mind when he was writing was still in the future. The perfect had not yet come. The perfect was going to come as far as Paul was concerned. So the next question that we have to ask ourselves is, has it happened sometime between when Paul wrote the letter and today? Could we have missed the perfect coming? 
I mean, there's hundreds of people who have come over the last numbers of centuries who said, I'm the Christ, I'm Jesus, I'm come. Could we have missed Jesus coming? The Bible has a whole lot to say about when the perfect will happen, when the perfect will come, when Jesus comes. If it had already happened, we'd expect to see around us those things that, Paul, that the Bible talks about in relation to that coming. We're just going to look at one of those. It's in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. The apostle John is, is writing, he's one of the 12 apostles, an eyewitness of the resurrection. He was given this picture of what would come in, in, in chapter 21 of Revelation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. And this throne was in the city that had come down from heaven, the new Jerusalem. Just to put that into context, it had come down to earth. And this loud voice from the throne was saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And verse 4 is the key here in this, in this timeline of Paul. We read, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. See, John uses the same language that Paul used in Corinthians. The former things, the partial, the incomplete that we now have, will pass away. See, if Jesus had already come into the world, we would expect this to be our experience today, right? But it's not. We all know that. Our bodies ache and groan. Sometimes we get up in the morning and it feels like we just fell out of a tree. Some of us did yesterday. Um, you know, when I wake up, when I, when I stand up, my, my, my knees are like a breakfast cereal. They snap, crackle, and pop. There's still tears in my eyes. We're, we're in the middle of this global pandemic with all the uncertainty, confusion, and division that creates. And there is mourning, there is crying, there is pain. Death is around us. None of us are immune. We all know and feel and experience these things. I don't think any of us would, would think that because based on these experiences that we've missed Jesus coming, right? We don't have that Revelation 21 experience in the world today. So that means that we're still on mission today. We're still in the now, looking to the then. The, the now, but not yet. And in this now, we are, we are empowered by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, manifesting himself in us as he wills. And that's good news. We haven't missed Jesus. Paul uses an illustration in verse 11 to, to drive home his point. It's an illustration of a child growing up and putting off childish ways when mature. It's something I think most of us, anyway, could, all, could relate to in one way or another. Verse 11 says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. It seems pretty clear, doesn't it? Paul is saying that growth happens, and by it we mature. But at some defined point, he has a point in mind, when maturity is reached, then the former things, the childish ways, are put away. We don't have to go back to those childish ways because there's no point. They're done with. They're put away. Like all illustrations, this one breaks down a little bit, especially in English, because we miss the point that, Paul, that the Corinthians would have caught. See, Paul is clarifying the perfect in the previous verse. We tend to define perfect a little differently uh, than what they would have. Uh, in, in the, the illustration would have made sense to the Corinthians because the word perfect in Greek had the dual meaning of being fully mature and fully complete. It's the end goal of growth. Fully grown, completely mature, perfect. Thus prophecy, tongues, knowledge are needed when we were children, but when we mature in the resurrection, when the perfect comes, we no longer need those helps and aids as we do now. To make us understand when it is that the perfect comes, take a look at the next verse, verse 12. Paul's going to make his second argument, or second point. He re we read, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So this time he starts with the illustration. He starts with the mirror. Paul says, 
Look in the mirror. Has anyone ever told you that? Look in the mirror. What do you see? What do you see first thing in the morning when you get up? Is it scary? For some of us, the mirror says, go back to bed, right? We typically see a pretty good reflection of ourselves. It's a pretty good uh, reflection of reality. You know, when we smile at the mirror, the mirror smiles back at us. We stick our tongue out at the mirror and the mirror says right back at you, right? We can't get sassy with the mirror. Not so in first century Corinth. You see, all, for all but the extremely wealthy, mirrors were not quite as good as they are today. Far from it, actually. Um, they were typically just polished metal. So think of it this way. If you go home today, take a piece of tin foil, use the shiny side because it'll, you'll have a head start, but get it really smooth, right? Just really keep rubbing and rubbing and rubbing it till it's really smooth, and then hold that up, and that's your mirror. That would have been the first century Corinthian mirror. You know, it's really good for that first morning look, right? It's, hey, not too bad. It's a little fuzzy, but uh, it looks pretty good, right? The reflection is there, but it's not quite so flattering. Uh, a little fuzzy. And Paul contrasts this imperfect view, this imperfect reflection, that, that poor imperfect reflection, to seeing somebody face to face, right? Specifically seeing Jesus face to face. John in his letter refers to it this way in 1 John chapter 3. He writes, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we should be like him, because we shall see him as he is. All throughout this morning, there's going to be a whole lot of then and now, uh, you know, the, the present and the future, right? So it's these things here, that we will be, what we will be in the future has not yet appeared, but we, we know that when he appears, future tense, we should be like him because we shall see him as he is. Spurgeon, the great 19th century preacher, paints a picture of this moment when he would see Jesus face to face with these words. He writes, The streets of gold will have small attraction to us. The harps of angels will but slightly enchant us. Compared with the king in the midst of the throne, he it is who shall rivet our gaze, absorb our thoughts, enchain our affection, and, we, and move all our sacred passions to the highest pitch of celestial ardor, we shall see Jesus. The book of Revelation uses the same language of Paul when it tells us, we shall, when we see him, we will see him face to face. Not off in the far distance, you know, not, not on that horizon way off in the distance, but up close, face to face. To help kind of picture what that face-to-face -face moment might be like, consider an Olympic athlete whose pursuit of that gold medal for years and years, all the training that went into it, all the mental discipline, picturing the moment, the feeling that she has when the official is standing in front of her, standing right there, that moment, face-to-face, as he puts the gold medal around her neck and says, well done. Or the hockey player, overtime game seven of the Stanley Cup finals, right? The puck goes in and the team goes absolutely nuts at that moment. But it's when the commissioner is standing there in that moment, face to face with the captain, holding the trophy and puts it in his hands and says, well done. Or a biblical example, a couple of them actually. Think of Mary Magdalene, Sunday morning on her way to Jesus' tomb. I mean, her world has been completely shattered. Her heart has been ripped out of her. Overcome with grief and love for the one who had rescued her, the one who had saved her, going to that tomb in the morning. And the gardener standing there shows up, but he's not the gardener. In that moment, when her eyes are opened and she has the realization that the gardener, who the gardener is, that she is face to face with Jesus. He who was dead and now alive. Or what about the apostles? Still reeling from the, the, the duality of the, uh, the finality of Jesus' death and all that that brings and all the emotion that that brought and these reports from the, these, these crazy women who are saying that Jesus is alive. How can that be true? How can we rationalize those two things? And that moment... 
when someone walks through the wall and stands in their midst and says, face to face, shalom, peace be with you. And there's Jesus. You might be asking, and it's a fair question, how is it possible to look God face to to look at God face to face and not die? Doesn't the Bible say that if we do that, we shall surely die? Think of Moses, the great lawgiver and deliverer, you know, the one who parted the Red Sea, who spoke to the to the rock and water came out, the one who God used to deliver his people and bring them into the promised land. Surely Moses was a greater man than me. Surely he had more faith. He was more holy than I am. Yet when Moses went up to the mountain, did he see God face to face? Well, no, he didn't. That's not how the story goes. God passed by him. Moses never looked at God in the face. He was hiding, and rightly so, in fear in the cleft of the rock. But even that closeness, that nearness to God, when Moses came down from the mountain, he just glowed with the, with the presence and the glory of God. How is it possible? Sinful men and women like you and me, in the presence of a holy God, face to face. See, later in Corinthians, Paul will say, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable put on the imperishable. How can a sinful man and a holy God be reconciled in such a way that they can be face to face and the man live? Paul answers that for us also later on in Corinthians in this letter. And as a spoiler alert, he says, how is it possible? The short answer is, we can't. But through Jesus, we can. And that's the great mystery. Paul writes that the imperishable will put on, sorry, the, the perishable will put on the imperishable. At the last trumpet sound, on that day that is coming, that day when the perfect comes, and the partial puts away, passes away, we put on the imperishable. Just as Jesus rose bodily from the grave, uh, resurrected with an imperishable body, he will give us a new robe to wear, a new body of our own. Our tired, old, achy bodies exchanged for a new one. No more waking up and groaning at that first step out of bed, or falling into bed exhausted at the end of the day. Exhausted from the constant bombardment of COVID talk. Exhausted from parenting. Exhausted from just life. From work. From whatever it is. The bottom line is that we who are his children will rise from the dead bodily just as he did. With a new body that will never die. And then that future time we will stand before Jesus. In that moment imperishable face to face. And hear those words. Well done. And all of this, all of this is possible because of love. It's possible because of 1 Corinthians 13 love, Jesus' love. See, Jesus' love keeps no record of wrongs. The world has social media now that records absolutely everything. Just try running for politics and watch your past record come crashing up to you real quick. See, Jesus' love always forgives. We hold on to stuff just in case we need some ammo for the, some future argument, right? You can never have enough ammo in your ammo pack, right? So we do that. We collect all these, these things. Jesus' love forgives. Jesus' love bears all things. Me, I want to just keep putting stuff, my grudges, my pet peeves, my envy, my bitterness into my own backpack and carrying it around with, with that prideful, you know, I've got it. I can handle it. Jesus says, give me that. I will bear that too. See, Jesus' love took our sins and nailed him on his cross. In Jesus' love, our deserved punishment was exchanged for his matchless grace. Do you see how through this whole section, Paul is keep, keeps holding up two things, two parallel thoughts. The first thing is the partial, the unclear, the poor reflection over here in this hand. And he's showing how that this is lesser, this is, impor is, is, is less important, less perfect than what's over here, the fullness or the perfect in this other hand. And the contrast is clear. The partial, the complete, the mere dimly, the face-to-face, -face, the then, or the now and the then. And we can let that soak in and we can just, uh, those thoughts just can, can uh, encourage us and, and, and to soothe our hearts. 
We can do that, but not for long. Because just when you think it couldn't get any better than that, Paul cranks it up a notch at the end of verse 12. He he writes, Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Paul keeps holding this knowing partially in this hand. And I like to think of it as uh, all knowledge that man has ever known up to this point, right? Put it in this hand. You know, everything that Google has, every medical journal, every scientific periodical dumped in here. And we can even dump everything we know about God. We can even dump the, the, the Bible in here because as good as the Bible is, there's a lot more that we don't know that will be revealed to us, it tells us here. You know, at the end, book, in the end of the book of John, he writes that there's so many other things that could have been written, but there are not enough volumes on all of earth to hold them, right? So there's so much more that we know about, that we will know about God. So that's just a part. That's now. But then when you, we see him face to face in this hand, it says we will know fully. We will have a, an accurate and a complete knowledge of who he is. Right? We'll know all the rest of those stories that John is alluding to. Right? We'll, we'll walk with Moses. We'll talk to Elijah. We'll, we'll know that complete picture. We'll see God face to face. And we'll know. Even as we have been fully known. What is Paul saying there? Did you catch the tense in that phrase? Right? As we have been past tense, which means that right now, I am fully known by God. He knows everything about me, yet he chooses to still love me. He knows when I mourn and he comforts me. He knows my temptations. He experienced all the same temptations. And when I fall, when sin ensnares me and I reach out in repentance, he takes my hand, picks me up, and puts me back on my feet. Like any parent would do, when their child is just learning how to walk, right? They fall and and you cheer the attempt, but then you pick them up. You don't just leave them rolling around on the ground in pain. You pick them up. Jesus says, next time temptation happens, come talk to me first, right? And he is patient. He picks me up over and over again. He knows my joy and he rejoices with me in it. In the same way as that I rejoice with my grandkids when I take two spoons and I go down to the freezer and go to the, get some ice cream. You know, it's my joy and it's their joy as well. So he rejoices with our joy. He knows our struggles. He knows your struggles. Whatever that is in this moment. Your physical pain of bodies that are breaking down, that are not working the way they're supposed to. He knows the mental stress that you're under, the weight of the world just kind of crashing in from all over. And it seems like you can't handle it anymore. The emotional roller coaster that you might find yourself on, the highs are really high and the lows are really low. He knows that. He knows that about you. He knows the spiritual battle that rages in and around you when other people may not see it. Everything. He he fully knows us. He has always fully known us. And that's comforting because in the mess of the struggle... God is always there. He never leaves us or forsakes us. We are never alone. God has always fully known us. He told Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were conceived, I knew you. Paul takes it further in Ephesians when he writes, even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So not just before we were conceived, but before the world was created, he knew us. He's always known us. And despite our failures, yet while we were still rebellious sinners, sticking up our nose at God, cursing his name, Christ died for us. Not because we were good or obedient, but because he was. And on that future face-to-face day, we will know him fully as we have been fully known. Isn't that good? You know, as comforting as that can be in the present, and as beautiful as that will be, as wonderful as that will be in the future, it can also be very scary depending on where you stand in Christ. 
Say, we will all see Jesus face to face. Not all of us will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. As believers, we can easily get caught up in the then, in the beauty of the, of the then, the, the majesty of the perfect of the then, and start to look around us and almost become depressed. Well, don't do that. Paul doesn't let us do that because Paul isn't done with love. Is Paul ever done when he writes? Because there's, only, there's not 12 verses in this chapter on love. There's 13. So let's look at verse 13. So now. So mentally underline or highlight that word. Now means today. Where we're sitting today. So now, faith Hope and love abide. <clears throat> and that word abide, that's not one that we, that we use a whole lot these days. That means to remain or to dwell, to make a home with us, which is what God does. Jesus makes his home with us. He abides with us. Um, it's not just something that we experience. You know, we go out on a date with Jesus and then we, we move on to something else. He's living in and with us. He abides. These three... But the greatest of these is love. So now these three things. So if we break that down individually, faith. First of all, faith. Faith is always in an object. And here it's clearly faith in Jesus. <clears throat> it is something that we not only believe in, but believe into. See, I can believe and have faith that water is wet. But it's not until I jump into the pool that I really experience wetness. Right? Or putting it another way, I can, I can have faith in that swinging rope bridge over the deep gorge. Right? I can know and I can believe that it'll hold my weight as I cross. I've seen others cross over. You know, and I can put my foot gingerly on the, on the bridge, and, but still holding on to that post. Right? Just, just, just testing the waters, so, so to speak. But it's not until I step onto or into that bridge and fully letting go. Um, do I have faith into, into the bridge? It's not until then will I abide in faith. You know, it's the same way we can have knowledge that Jesus is Lord and Savior. I can even believe that his death and believe deeply that his death was a substitution in exchange for my sin. I can believe that he died and he, that he rose from the dead. I can believe all of those things. But until we put our faith into Jesus, into these things... Step onto the bridge, let go of our fears and doubts, and jump in fully. Until then, it's just head knowledge. It's not, it's not saving faith. When we jump in into his arms and fully rest in Jesus, that's the faith that Paul is talking about. The second of these, hope. And I love the, the video that you played at the beginning describing hope through the Bible. There's two verses in 1 Peter that kind of sum it up, and I'm not sure if they have them on the screen or not. 1 Peter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, the hope that we have is a living hope. It's not something that is, is just a fleeting thing. It's, it's, it's alive. Our hope is alive. Later on in that chapter, verse 13, Peter wrote, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober. So the idea there is that we have to be fully alert, you know, not just blind hope, not blind faith, just so we, 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 we got all the facts straight. And then it says, Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his, at his coming. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you. See, if faith sets our eyes on the work of Jesus that is finished on the cross and the empty tomb, those, those past events. If that is faith, then hope sets our eyes on the future coming of Jesus. Those two ends, the first coming and the second coming, faith and hope. That's where the Christian is headed. That is our hope, our assurance. It's the promise that's ours now in Christ. Hope looks to the then and the now. So what about love? What's love got to do with it? As we examined previously in these verses of love, we see that love is both a verb and a person. It's something that we do, not on our own, because we tend to fail miserably when we try to love on our own, don't we? Uh, and it, it hurts every time we hit the ground, falling flat on our face. 
But we can do it because of Jesus. Because love isn't just a verb, love is a person, it's Jesus. That's who we reflect. When we love others, we are showing Jesus' love to others. Uh, at least when we're, show, when we're loving others the way this chapter describes love, right? With the Jesus love. We show Jesus to the world. And even in our impartial, imperfect way, we still reflect the perfect Jesus. We illuminate him. And whatever we do, be it miracles or speaking in tongues, prophecy, preaching, teaching, healing, helping, serving, without love, that's right, go back to verse 1, we're just that noise, that clanging symbol. symbol. But there's one thing that faith, that, that uh, both faith and hope have in common that sets them apart from love. The need for faith and hope will end. When the perfect comes, when Jesus returns, we see him face to face, have that clear and, and perfect uh, and accurate uh, knowledge. There's no more need for faith because the object of our faith will have been fully realized. There'll be no more reason to hope because the, the object of our hope, the, the one that we put our hope in, will be here also fully realized. But love, Jesus' love, well, it's going to keep growing. It gets better, it'll get better and better throughout all eternity. It will always be present because love never ends. Faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Greater love. Jesus had a thing or two to say on that matter. In John chapter 15, John writes, and this is Jesus speaking, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do as I, what I command you. You see, Jesus here was about to go to the cross. He knew it. It was just a short while away. He was going to lay down his life for his children, for his, the ones that he had chose. And he wanted his disciples to know at that moment that this was not just an act of love, that this was an act of greater love. But Jesus didn't just leave that as a teaching moment, right? Just an explanation of what greater love was. He says, let me show you what I mean. And then he goes to the cross and he dies for them and for us. And Jesus implied that once I've shown you, I want you to do the same. Which all 12 of those disciples did. They laid down their lives for the sake of Jesus. So this love chapter, this greater Jesus love chapter, and this whole discussion on spiritual things, the spirit manifesting himself in and through the body, for the building up of the body, for proclaiming Jesus to each other, because that's important too, it's not just to the world, we proclaim Jesus first to each other and then to the world. It's just, I, it's, I, I can't get enough of just, under, just the magnificent and the beauty and the glory of this chapter. Gifts and love cannot be divorced from each other. It's one discussion. Paul tells us, and I peeked ahead to the next chapter. First part of verse 14 says that we are to pursue love, pursue it with a reckless abandon, and desire spiritual gifts. The two are intertwined. They're wrapped up. So today, let God use love and let God use you, use you to be a mirror you see, we will see Christ face to face, but now we see Christ in part. We see Christ in his people, a reflection, imperfect, of who he is. This is the why and the what of spiritual gifts, so that through the Spirit working, that the Spirit working in and through us, we would see Christ. That we would see the good news, we would see the gospel, and that it would change us. It would bring us to repentance daily, um, the overflow, the very love that Christ demonstrated. These gifts, grounded in love, grounded in faith, hope, and greater love, are meant to proclaim Jesus to the world. So until the perfect comes, let's pray. Father, thank you for just uh, allowing us the, the peek into this chapter on love. 
And we look forward to that day, that hope that we have as believers in the, in the future when you come and we get to see you face to face and we get to know fully and we get to, to experience you fully and walk with you forever in love. And we just thank you, Lord, that, that, you've, uh, that you even seek to use us to be a reflection of who you are because we look at ourselves and we just see the flaws and we see the imperfections and we see the, 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 the roughness and yet you use us to reflect Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that we can be the, that imperfect mirror to the world. And just help us to, to reflect accurately who Jesus is in our words, in our actions, in, in the way that we love, the way that we experience and show and, and then live out Jesus' love. So I just thank you today for the opportunity to, to look into your word and just use that to comfort us today. Use that to, to bring us joy. Use that to just... Uh, um, to go with us to that knowledge that love never ends, that you're always with us. Uh, and we just do this in Jesus' name. Amen.